But what I really am linking about that Nagoma character is that it was native joy and kind of native, yes. just every day, here I am, you know, I'm going to go get some food for dinner. I'm going to get some berries right. or whatever. I want to write that. I want to write the native joy. Everybody, and welcome back to Miss Shelved, your bi weekly dose of bookstore love. I'm your host, Nicole Brinkley, joined by our new producer. She's eight months old, a ball of gray fur, and was recently rescued from the Wayward Ranch Animal Sanctuary in Kerhongston, New York. If you hear background noises, yes, I have a new cat. And as of the time of this recording, she has not officially been named. Send your bookish name suggestions to us at Miss Shelved Pod. For those of you who are new to the podcast, baby, you got to get off my, you're on my, my keyboard. For those of you who are new to the podcast, welcome. Every two weeks, I introduce you to an independent bookseller in conversation with an author they love. And there's not usually a cat involved. Our independent bookseller for today should be involved in everything. It's the legendary Lee Francis. Guazzi, this is Lee Francis. I am the owner and proprietor of Red Planet Books and Comics in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the only Native American comic book shop in the world. Lee is in conversation with Don Quigley. Bonjour, Anine, everybody. My name is Don Quigley. I'm a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe and also a children's author. Settle in as these two do a deep dive into Native representation, how it's doing, how we got here, and what they're looking forward to. Yay. So this is great, Dawn. I am super excited. Just recently, we were doing a, a wonderful retreat for native writers and you got the chance to interview me and and this is a wonderful chance i think for us to continue that conversation that we had started both online and offline so i'm thrilled this Absolutely. is so i'm stoked yeah i'm super excited i have a confession to make about the last time i interviewed you i checked about 15 minutes beforehand because i thought you were interviewing me what? <laughs> So I had to come up with questions really fast. Nice. But you did not sense the panic, did you? <laughs> no, it was great. You just like had a whole list. Of, you were just popping off your head. It was fantastic. <laughs> so it just gave me a chance to be like, well, let me tell you, let me espouse all the great things about, you know, <laughs> you, you know, comic books and graphic novels and, and just being a big old native nerd. So this is great. And, you know, coming from the Southwest and, and my family is from the Pueblo of Laguna, I think we have lots of, of backgrounds in writing, but I want to just start with sort of the opening sharing between you and me about what was the first thing that you remember writing? I think I remember writing really bad poetry, like when I was supposed <laughs> to be taking notes. <laughs> and, 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 you know, but, it, you know, I never showed it to anybody. I think that's so common. Um, and so I never really wrote anything longer than like an essay for school. Um, never in a million years did I ever think I'd be a, a published children's author. <laughs> That's awesome. I think, uh, I think my first piece was, uh, it was called The Purple Cow. And it was about a purple cow that just was hanging out in a pasture by himself and then went on a little adventure over the mountains and, and past some rivers and found all of these other multicolored cows to hang out with. So even back then, I was writing about diversity. It was cow diversity. <laughs> and the visual cow. aspect, I love it, right? Cowversity, right? Um, early, <laughs> early kid stuff. So, but that's, that's a good jump off point because you do have a long background. Uh, you know, I think we both do in, in multi spaces of writing, right? So, you know, poetry and academics and now books and kids books and whatnot. So what was the first published work? So I did do a lot of essays and my first book was uh, published by UND Press. It's called Apple in the Middle. That was mm -hmm. August of 2018. 
I had no idea. I still don't know how to write a book, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I just kept writing. I mean, I just felt that I was being asked to tell a story about what it was like going up in the summers to my Turtle Mountain relatives, especially because my girls, um, they, they will never get that opportunity because my grandparents passed on. And so that was my first book. Um, and that was great. I think that was right before Native Kidlet really exploded, thanks to mm -hmm. Cynthia Lettick Smith, the amazing mm -hmm. person. And then I wrote something for Scholastic, a Native American Heroes, and it's a picture book, mm -hmm. nonfiction, and mm -hmm. just a different way that we see what a hero might be instead of thinking like wealth and fame and this amazing sports person. It's, you know, in Native communities, we think heroes are helpers. That was my my previous ones. And then definitely I've got my new series, Jojo McCoons. It's the first yes. Native American chapter book series, uh, yep. quirky little Ojibwe Jojo. Yeah. And then, like I said, the amazing Cynthia Lettick Smith, she invited mm -hmm. a lot of us Native Kidlet authors to write a chapter for the anthology. It's a middle grade anthology, Ancestor Approved, and it's all mm -hmm. centered around a powwow weekend. So that was that was really fun. Yeah, I, I, I love all of those books. Uh, you know, I'll definitely fanboy here. I think, you know, it's been amazing to see this incredible explosion right like of all of this native kid lit because because i've been in the you know say in the business because my dad was running a, a nonprofit wordcraft circle of native writers and storytellers which i still so that's my side hustle like helping you know work with young people and you know and connecting them with them or, uh, professional writers and and whatnot and so i grew up in this and i remember you know i think what do we try to title these things like first wave native lit came out in the 60s you know and then there was like second wave in like the 90s and and now we're at this like i was like oh this isn't a wave anymore this is a tsunami right like the stuff that's been coming out has been just blowing the doors off of me and i was like wow we finally can fill just shelves with with native books and i know we talked about this before but i think that's been one of the things that both of us were looking at in terms of you know, like why we both started writing about the big issue of representation, you know, and not having stuff for my students or my son, you know, th that looked like him in these spaces. So I know you've got the the only one in the world of Native <clears throat> comic book star. Mm -hmm. um, and so did you start writing? Like why comics? I'm just, I mean, you're probably <laughs> a fanboy, um, but I'm really curious about that format. Why did you pick that? Yeah. Um, I mean, part of it is just the nerd part right like i grew up as a nerd uh you know as an indigenous nerd as i like to say i am a proud indigenous nerd very proud exactly and and i grew up with a lot of this my dad was huge into science fiction and fantasy and so i lived in those worlds and as a kid anytime like i'd see a native in film right or anytime i'd see a native in comics i would get really excited but there was always maybe something just a little bit off right so you know, you'd see, you'd see like, uh, what was it? I remember it was a great episode of Star Trek at the time because it was like seeing native actors. And it's the one where they go to the, this planet where all like the native folks have left and they know how to like merge through time space. And which is accurate. Uh, of course. Oh, no. I mean, philosophically, it, I was like, yeah, well, duh. We always, duh. you know, I mean, like that's the slipstream. I mean, we can talk indigenous futurisms, but that was, you know, I kind of remember it. Now I go back and look at it and it's really tropey. And so yeah. I think for me, when I think this is where kind of my, you know, where our, our educational interests uh, align with you and me is that I just wanted to see the kinds of things on the shelves that would really interest my students. There was at the time before then, because we started, say, I think we started publishing before we even opened the bookstore. We started publishing I, almost eight years ago. And you know, there was like three or four native comics that were widespread enough, right? That it had gotten enough traction to be kind of like noticed by folks. And so I, I was like, man, I like writing in this world. I like writing in pictures because a lot of times when I, I sit down to write, it's really kind of overwhelming to stare at that blank page when I'm thinking that I got to fill it with just like words, 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 you know, but if I'm writing in images in my head, that makes it a lot easier. So that was kind of why I jumped in. I mean, I had already done lots of poetry before that. I was a slam poet, but that was essentially why I jumped into making comics and just wanting to have a, you know, a, a spinner rack full of comic book characters created by, for, and about Native peoples.
Yeah, I love that what you said yeah. about growing up. You know, you saw like one representation. You know, I remember growing up, um, 70s, early 80s, watching Grizzly Adams. And you know what? Yeah. My first TV crush was Nakoma, <laughs> the, the Indian <laughs> character. Yes. And, but you, like, like you, you look back now and yes, I made a valid TV crush choice, but you know, it's like just so stereotypical. I mean, I don't think he ever talked, but somehow Grizzly Adams knew the native sign language. Right. Um, you know, then you throw like a grizzly bear in there, but still right. well, that was it. And I think I just got excited to, to see, to see that. And I think for me, one of the things I really, uh, I'm just having an epiphany with you right now, Lee, <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think that it was a positive representation because, you know, it is true. There's there's so much loss in Native history, language, culture that mm -hmm. we need to learn that. People need to write about that. But what I really am linking about that Nagoma character is that it was Native joy and kind of Native yes. just every day here I am. You know, I'm going to go get some food for dinner. I'm going to get some berries right. or whatever. I want to write that. I want to write the native joy. I'm not going to yeah. say never. I have an upcoming thing that's a little more serious about a serious topic, but um, definitely. I mean, that hits for me as well, because what I have pushed back really hard against is the idea of fetishizing native tragedy, right? It's because that's what pop culture has really done. It focuses only on the despair, right? The, the tragic chief, you know, that knows that he's not long for this world and he's torn between two worlds. And, and it is a fetish, right? It's a fetishization of these things that have happened to Native people. It's almost like these, these re-traumatizing experiences is like, all right, let's take a moment to think about Wounded Knee. And I was like, yeah, and I don't want to dismiss the atrocities yes. that were committed, but if that's all we're doing, then we're trapped in this cycle we're trapped in this joyless cycle of, you know, where we, where we're constantly reliving our own tragedy and our own decimating experiences historically, you know, the, the blood memory. Right. And that's one thing I love about what you've done is even when we can, we can talk about the things that happened, but it doesn't have to be mired in that. It can be about a joyful rebirth and resilience and, I mean, for me, whenever I finish writing and the books that I love to see the most that are coming out right now is, yo, Native folks are still here. I put them at the end of every book. I like living Native people, you yes. know, and not the dead on the battlefield. Yeah, I think as educators, that's something that, you know, sadly, you know, like my own kids when they were younger would come home with just like this trauma and that's all it was. And it kept everybody in the past. I always say there's mm -hmm. two letters in native literature that literally is our life or death. And it's S or D, the past tense, you know, um, <laughs> Don and Lee lived in yep. New Mexico versus Don lives in Minnesota. You could obviously tell from her Minnesota accent, she eats pizza and she goes to Target. And so I think there's so many people that like, they really do think that Native people are extinct. I've been in those classrooms. I've literally walked into those. And, and it's weird because you don't... So when I started teaching, I started teaching on the res, right? And I taught mm -hmm. at my home reservation. I taught at Laguna Acoma High School. So I didn't think about it as much at that point because, man, that's all my kids. They're all around me. I can see them all, you know? And so it's this interesting flip because it's a protection from the outside world, but all the kids are right there. And then I go and I'm working on my PhD in Texas and I'm working in the education systems there and I'm going to go talk to kids in like central Texas where they did a marvelous job of wiping out their native population, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. you know, hashtag sarcasm. And I walk into a classroom and the kids are just like, it's, it is those standard questions. And it was weird because I had heard it from all of my other educator friends that worked in primarily non-native institutions where it was like, well, do you live in a teepee? Uh, you know, uh, I didn't know there were any natives left kind of questions, right? And I was like, it was a profound change because I had never experienced it. I was yeah. adult enough to be able to understand it, but I had never experienced it up to that point. I was going to pick up on what you said about kids honestly asking you if you live in teepees. One of the things that I do work with non-Native teachers about how to bring in respectful representations of Native people into the classroom and libraries. And I do this, uh, I call it Waska and Jeopardy. It's like 10 lightning round speed questions. And it's really <laughs> to, to kind of shake them up. And so one of the questions I always say, write down a Native American dwelling. And then, you know, mm. we do all this other stuff. And then I come back and what do you think they always write? 
TV, right? TV wigwam. And I show a picture of my house. And I said, oh, I said, don't you keep me in, in the past. You got to always right? gotta check yourself with that. And, and um, I, mean, I don't do it to be a gotcha, but it's just to, to sort of reboot, especially educators, because educators are really, the, uh, and librarians, are, they're just such the gatekeepers of Native literature. That's why I think it's just brilliant that you opened your shop. And dare I say, there's going to be a second location on the East Coast. Yes, we're working on it right now. Hopefully we will have that up sooner rather than later. You know, it takes a little bit of time to get, you know, the, the places identified, but we've got a couple of good, good ideas because we really want to be able to start bringing in, continue to bring in more voices. One of the things that I've really noticed in the work that we've done is that it's kind of regionalized, right? I mean, you, the U.S. is pretty big and there's 600 plus, you know, tribal nations and, you know, communities and all these folks around. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens on the East Coast doesn't permeate past the Mississippi, you know? And so I was like, well, I've been looking at it for years. I was like, let's go bring in more of our relatives, you know, let's make sure that they get their stories represented. So it's not just, you know, teepees and what I like to say, the absolutely like yoked native on horseback, you know, with the flowing hair and headdress and bow and arrow. Right. And I was like, yeah, yeah. A lot of us, like 70% of us live in cities, man. Like we got to go to work every day. I mean, a lot of my family worked on the railroad, right. You know, that's not how I wake up in the morning. I'm like, well, oh, I'm, I'm here. Let me, uh, you know, you put my headdress on and all of my turquoise and all of my everything, you know, just to go down. I've got to go, you know. I'm going to push back. I, I, it is to so stereotypical that I like, I love turquoise. I do too. I don't want to say that, that I don't. Yeah. Listen, I've got plenty and I've got plenty of like, I've, I mean, I'm a little bit more nerd enabled now, but I've got my nerd medallions. I've got my beaded stuff. I was like, oh my gosh. Oh yeah, I, was, I love wearing that when I go out. I do you too. Know, it's one of my favorite things. But, you know, it's not my only thing, right? No, I, I get I get it. I'm teasing you. We tease. That's what we do. And, you know, it's so funny. I, I had to explain to, um, I was at this, you know, in the before times when I, there was actually like in-person writing retreats and stuff. I had to explain to this non-Native editor who was just so kind. And we were, a couple of us Native kids at office, we were kind of teasing him, like lovingly. And I, and, mm -hmm. I, and I don't think he knew what to do with that. It was actually Arthur Levine. He's from Scholastic. But I said, Arthur, we tease you because we like you. That's what Native people do. He goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> in a not yeah in a non mean way right yes he owns yeah. his own yeah he moved he moved over to amazing. his his uh yeah his new space and he's been doing great work as well because he's been doing a lot of incredible outreach I think they put what Eric Gansworth they brought him over for one of the books if I recall correctly yeah Darcy Little Badger ooh do you want to know some super secret news. Oh, tell me. I love secret news. Somebody, maybe like Don Quigley, PhD, um, <laughs> may have something coming out with him. Awesome. I was going to say, actually, that sounded like a really good title for a TV show. Um, Don, <laughs> Don Quigley, PhD. I think we should... I think we should pitch that to Hollywood. You're my sidekick, and we go through libraries at night, and we like get rid of all of the native Heck. trash books. Yes, that was so racist. Yes, let's do yes. it. But then we got we, we have to wear turquoise because that like we can get through all the sensors. That's right. It, it, it reflects it. silver and turquoise reflects off all the the laser beam. That's perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, uh, Hollywood, if you're listening, um, <laughs> you know, we've got we've got two great writers to and and performers that will make an amazing show for you out there. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. So that's actually I did want to ask. I, I, I knew peripherally, but I didn't realize your Ph.D. was in education. So, yeah, we were going to trade stories real quick on that. So why did you decide to go into that line? <laughs> so, um, so I taught for 18 years. I loved it. I was a co-director of an Indian ed program. I taught everything from kindergarten up through ninth grade. I really kind of settled most of my career in junior high, middle school. Um, either you love that age or you run screaming from it. But I loved, I loved them. And then I just thought I love my dear teacher friends, my non-native teacher friends also. But I just saw that there was no. Um, in their teacher preparation programs, uh, when they were going to college, there's little to no 
um, understanding about how to bring in representation um, respectfully of Native history, language, and culture. And so mm-hmm. um, I got a job in higher ed. It's my eighth year here at a university. And if you're at a university and you want to get tenure and you want to get promoted, you kind of have to get a PhD. So it wasn't right. like some altruistic thing. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> The <laughs> necessity, but so that was my dissertation about. Um, I kind of uh, came up with um, some new. Uh, um, look at me! I'm fancy. I can't even think of the word for research. <laughs> All that PhD work down the drain. <laughs> some qualitative um, coding methods about mm-hmm. some things, and it's linked to land. And apparently, I should try to like get that published. But you know what, Lee? I don't know if you feel like me, but. I'm just really done with academic writing. Like, I just want to write yep. for kids. Yeah. No, I've got one cooking, but it's a basically it's a nerd book. So I've been trying to put together, because uh, I give this talk about the history of natives and pop culture. And I people are just oh, like, where can we awesome. find that? And so I'm like, all right. So I started sitting down and it was really interesting to sit back down and start doing academic research again. Yeah. to start writing, I was so rusty. I was like, I yeah. don't even know where to look anymore. Like, it's still going to be slightly freewheeling. It's going to be a, you know, I'm going to aim a little more towards like Michael Chiasi's Native Americans in comics, which is, you know, he's got a, a really great kind of tone and style. And it's the book on the history of Native American representation in comic books. It's fantastic. But still just trying to remember how to research because, you know, I went in for my PhD mostly because what I wanted to be able to do, very similar, I was looking at a way of trying to support my community. So I went into school improvement and educational leadership because what I saw was in the systems that we work in, a lot of the times you'd have outsiders come in to communities and, you know, they're, they, were, they were kind of being, as my dad used to put it, you know, with a little bow, doctors one and all. But it wasn't necessarily earned in that way because they weren't bringing, you didn't have any counterpoint to it. It was just like they had the PhD after their name. So it gave them this particular authority, but not community-based. And, and so I was like, well, I mean, we need to add more PhDs and folks that can speak and support on behalf of our communities, you know, in, in the way that I found, you know, po- the best way I found possible. Um, and then, of course, my, my long-term joke is I got a PhD so I could open a comic shop. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know what? The, like my dad always says, he says, the only good thing about a PhD is when you're calling to get restaurant reservations and you can say two for Dr. Quigley, you know, that's yes. about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to go back to like writing a dissertation and, and you know, to your people listening, I'm going to tell you, Native people, we have like this circular way of getting to the uh-huh. point. Mm-hmm. So I was going to link even more like my research. I really pushed back on the, the kind of white Eurocentric research methodologies. And so I really pushed back on that. And so I really incorporated Native storytelling as a way to do most of my dissertation. And so telling, telling story. And so that was, that was, that was pretty cool. <clears throat> That is brilliant because that's exactly what I did. And I had an incredible advisor that allowed me the freedom to be able to do that. And I wrote my findings section as a play. So I got to do an interpretive drama. Oh my gosh, I did too. I did not play, but I call, in fact, in fact, I have a very special term that I I created. It's called indigenous storializing, where you take data and, and you place it in the Genius. land and then yeah. you like tell the story as if you're like in, in and on the water. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is like a nerdy wow. thing to say. I'm going to read your piece. I'm going to read your dissertation. Vice later. versa. That's awesome. Well, and I did it, I mean, for me, very similar because what I found was my pushback. I, I did two things. My pushback against the academy was that I didn't want to keep telling the history of Native education over and over and over again, right? Which is what... Yeah. A lot of the previous dissertations when I was doing lit review was like, so let me tell you, Native education began in blah, and I was like, oh, we, why are we, why are we having to do this every single time? Like, I'm going to write this dissertation on my terms. I'm going to write on my terms. And my advisor was like, go for it. It makes sense, but go for it. And so I also didn't because of that. And I had a, another colleague of mine that was working on their PhD was that, you know, you're not supposed to use block quotes. Right. And I was like, well, but that's a problem for me because I was gifted this story. And yep. if I chop it up, I'm chopping up this gift. I'm chopping this gift. I'm parceling this gift out 
and turning into little objects that fit my narrative. But this story was told to me like this. And so that story needs, that section of the story needs to stay whole. And I made that reasoning, of course, you know, to justify what I was doing, but I was very clear. And my colleague was, you know, super, super jealous. She's like, man, I wish I had your advisor. They keep yelling yeah. at me up here. You can't have block quotes. And I was like, listen, this is native theory, native academic theory 101. You don't tell us how to write our own stories, you know? And I always say, you know, every university and every school is on native land. Like I went to University yep. of Minnesota. It's a land grant. Yep. Um, you know, so I had I had lots of lots of things to say, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which begs the question: You've got a couple of things coming out, but what more do we have to say, right? So where are we going with all of this in Native Lit, right? Yeah. So well, I just have to say, so my first book, <laughs> Apple in the Middle, was published. I think like a lot of Native authors, even like five years ago, by small either university presses or small presses. They were the ones who could see the potential. They could value the story. Mm -hmm. The big five, I think, really came through. I mean, Cynthia Lydic Smith, she's known by yep. her friends as Zinn. She has been instrumental in bringing this, um, along with Ellen O from We Need Diver Diverse Books, this idea about a native imprint. And so um, mm -hmm. she went to her longtime editor at HarperCollins, Rosemary Bronson, and mm -hmm. said, what would you think about doing an imprint of just native kidlet authors and yep. illustrators? And literally within 24 hours, I believe the answer was yes. <laughs> well, and duh. so that that <laughs> that like normalizes our stories. Um, yeah. I think it doesn't have to be the the stereotypical, you know, first act, second act, third act, you know, in the storytelling realm. And Rosemary's an amazing editor. Um, she edited my uh, she's editing my jojo series and you know it, it doesn't always have to fit and it doesn't always have to be explained to the yeah. what you know the non-native people it's like you know what it's okay if you don't get one of our jokes i'm not going to explain it <laughs> yeah i think that i mean the hard drive imprint it has been monumental right it's an imprint in one of the big five houses and from my perspective as the bookseller it it forces the industry to move on our terms you know, we're here so that they can't come back and just be like, oh yeah, no, we totally get native lit. We're native lit folks, you know? And I'm just like, no, it came from, it's by, for, and about. And you have the voices then get to start showing up on the shelves. And then that triggers, the, oh, well, well, then we need to be doing more of this. And then the mid-level publishers all start to come in, right? And then the smaller publishers start to get more traction because you're seeing like people are now looking for multiple books, not just one, because now they can order a box of native books as before, five, you know, five years ago, it's been lightning fast from my yes. perspective about how much, you know, how fast all of this stuff has come about. Because I remember when I, that we opened the shop <clears throat> four years ago, almost five, five this coming summer, 2022. And man, it was hard to fill my shelves. I was scrounging. I mean, I had a bunch of stuff in my, like my old stock. It was like my dad's used books and all the rest of that. But like, you know, trying to find stuff, just a, a shelf of books that you could fill it out. And it was, it was tough, you know, we moved through a lot of the same ones, but then into now, just this explosion. And I will say that you and, you know, Sin and who else is, who else is part of this new gangbuster group? Brian Young. Um, Christine Day, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of, um, oh gosh, there's, there's yeah. I mean, there's tons, yeah, it's, right? It's like amazing. there's so many more, you know, and I like to name drop more, but they're eluding me. I'm all academic out. I'm all named out. I can't think of anybody. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. um, Lee, what do you, like, do you have some news? I mean, I shared like my secret TV crush. Do you have any, any oh. news you want to share? Oh, um, yeah. I've got two things from, from the bookseller slash publisher side which is pretty uh, exciting, is that we just pre-listed for pre-sale a, a Howl, which is an indigenous anthology of wolves, werewolves, and Rougarou. Um, so that's Ooh. edited by Elizabeth LaPonce, features incredible native artists and illustrators. And then we also are releasing Roy Boney Jr., the fantastic Cherokee comic artist and amazing guy, um, his story gallery, story and gallery uh, called Sky. 
uh, which I am just so stoked. So we'll be listing that one out. That'll be on sale, uh, you know, coming into this next year. So it's going to be great. Um, 20, late 21, 22. And then for me, I am actually beginning to work on with our secretary of the interior, who is from my home Pueblo. I'm working with her daughter on secretary Holland's life story as a comic book. Wow. So, yep. But wait, wait, wasn't there something uh, museum-y ish? Oh yes. Uh, I, I, that's, <laughs> that's a good, look, with good close on that one. So yeah. So we've got a really great uh, museum exhibit. It's opening up this October 2021 at the National Museum of the American Indian in New York City called Native New York. Myself, Michael Shayasi, and a bunch of other amazing <laughs> Native illustrators put together some comic book pieces that are going in that. So it's super, super exciting. So That's um, awesome. I, I, everybody gets to go see it. So And I, I know um, that we're going to, we're running out of time. I'm just going to do my are. little... My little yeah. plug too. So um, I've got yes. Jojo number two comes out next spring. And then I also have like the super secret, super secret book, maybe with Arthur Levine and his new, um, and then what else do I have? Oh, I have an unannounced picture book with heart drum and then drum roll. Is this um, a super, okay, here we go. Yeah. Right. And then I, the, I, there is possibly a novel in verse book or two coming out awesome <laughs> so, awesome um, this is gonna be rad so much books so amazing yeah so we after we do our our detective show where we kind of you know get all the the bad junky native trauma icky books out of libraries that'd be so great to have like a convention like when we all meet again but um it looks like we are running out of time so um i'm so excited to be here to talk to dr lee and you yep. can find me at donquigley.com or on twitter at don e quigley you can find us at red planet books n comics that's the letter n red planet books and comics.com you can find me on Instagram at Pueblo Jones um, or Twitter, Lee Francis IV. Those are the places. And of course, I'm scattered all around Facebook. You can find our multiple pages. So uh, yeah, this has been awesome. so excited, uh, so exciting. I'm still excited. I can't even talk about it. It's amazing. <laughs> so this is wonderful. Thank you so much for, for chatting with me. And to everybody out there, thanks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, listening Thank to you. two Indigenous nerds. As they say, you know, uh, yarning. And Netflix, we're available to begin yep. building. Yeah, we, absolutely. We're, we're there. So, Don Quigley. All right, miigwetch, miigwetch, everybody. No, I, thanks, everybody, for listening. I could have listened to those two talk for another two hours. Thank you to Lee and Dawn for taking the time, and I hope you all scurry over either online or in person to Red Planet Comics. We'll be doing another publishing sort of deep dive next episode with a much-beloved romance author. Don't forget to subscribe so you can get the episode right away. Or if you want it early, you can join us on Patreon. Patreon allows you exclusive episodes, early access to episodes and essays, and helps me to pay our wonderful technical editor, Rebecca, and to feed our new producer, Kat. You can join us at patreon.com slash nebrinkley. We'll see you again in two weeks. Until then, happy reading.